Thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, especially Professor Leonis, who I am working currently in his department. You'll hear a very clear English accent. I am Canadian, uh, born and raised uh, with Greek background. Uh, uh, and there's lots to do in tobacco control here in Greece, so I thought, what a better, what better place to be uh, than to be working here. Uh, first of all, uh, my uh, disclosures, none uh, that are relevant to today's talk. And a little bit about uh, what I was asked to talk about. I am not a harm reduction specialist nor an expert in e-cigarettes, although I am following the research very carefully and the discussion in that regard. I was asked today to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of tobacco use in Greece today. It's a very interesting setting. And to talk a little bit about training interventions that involve the medical community, nurses, physicians, specialists, and talk a little bit about the best practice work we've been engaged in in Canada and today that is occurring in Europe uh, as a result of some European funded projects that have come forward. So that'll be my focus and uh, I'll touch a little bit on, on, our, on the interest from the medical community in this topic uh, and allow you to form your own opinions. I always like to start my talks with emphasizing how important this topic is and each time I speak to a group of physicians or other colleagues, single most important cause of death disability, there is nothing more important if we're going to address public health than to address tobacco use, bar none, no question about it. In Greece, three and a half million people today use tobacco. That's 35 to 37 percent, depending on which national survey or European survey you look at. I've heard even lower recently, but let's re rely on the, the best data. Higher in men than in women. And we were the number one until last year, uh, tobacco users in all of Europe. And we are now in second place to Bulgaria, who has uh, uh, now taken our place as the, the highest users of tobacco. And here are the stats for all uh, 28 European uh, countries that are part of some of the, the, the best surveys we have. You see Greece second to the top there in big declines. Now, not only do we use, uh, at a population level, the prevalence of tobacco use being the highest, we are also among the highest users of daily tobacco use, where the average is 14 in, in European countries. Here in Greece, it was 18. It's now 17.2. Uh, that's, that's, for an average, is a very high rate of tobacco use. Good news, there has been a decline in the last few years, in particular since 2009, we're starting to see a steep decline, uh, while 35 or 37 percent relative to other countries is very, very high, it really is. It is declining, we were above 40 percent uh, and, and almost at 50 several years ago. There's been a 27.7 percent decline overall uh, in tobacco use since 2009, and amongst youth it's been uh, particularly uh, dropping. The two extremes though are what's dropping is those under 24 and those those over 65 are who are quitting smoking, and in some cases they may have to quit because they are forced to being quit, and that's the over 65 group. Either they're actually uh, due to uh, death uh, from smoking-related illness or otherwise, or are because of illness are having to quit smoking. But it's the two extremes. So we've got the group in between that continue to, to smoke and quit at lower rates. Let's talk about the impact uh, here in Greece of tobacco use. 25,000 uh, of the almost 11 million uh, people living in Greece die each year of smoking-related illness. But this is a little more frightening because we see big death rates in, in countries across the world. We're looking here at a graph uh, from the EU mortality database, and you see here age standardized mortality from respiratory system. While all other countries are declining, Greece has increased 26% in the same period of time. You can see on the bar graph here, Europe is going down and Greece is going up. To move further along here, same uh, picture, uh, looking at all European countries, which uh, are in red and blue, depending on the, the group you would like to look at, and, and Greece being in blue, you can see as well that all countries are declining in cardiovascular mortality, a smoking-related illness, uh, but the decline is, is, is uh, certainly not as steep in Greece, so we're seeing a lower decrease over time in cardiovascular diseases. And here's a very important picture, uh, again, Greece being in blue, you can see across Europe, lung cancers, trachea of the bronchus, uh, um, and lung cancer itself in Greece is up by just a percentage, but in the same time period we're seeing big declines of around 12% in all of Europe. 
So we're, we're going in the wrong direction with respect to uh, the issue of smoking-related illness. You see the very high rates of tobacco use, and we wouldn't worry about it if it wasn't for this very severe uh, uh, trend in mortality. And anyone uh, such as myself who has lived elsewhere and has come to Greece, it's very clear how this affects families. Every day you hear about someone who has been diagnosed with cancer um, at a very young age, uh, as well as into to their uh, elder years. So let's talk a little bit about uh, quitting smoking, because that's the topic for today. First of all, uh, what we're looking at here is all of the European countries. Greece is uh, identified as the third in the bar chart here, uh, EL, Elava. Uh, and you can see here how many people have ever tried to quit smoking that are smokers right now? 20%. That means we have 17% of people uh, out there that have tried to quit smoking. 20% have never attempted in their lifetime. When I think of my work in Canada, it is rare to find someone who has never tried to quit smoking, even for a 24-hour period. And that's what we're finding here is people who are the hardened smokers, who uh, don't believe they're able to quit, and as such, don't make an attempt to quit smoking or can't find the, uh, the value in doing so. Here we're looking at, again, data from a number of Euro European countries, Greece being the first there. In the last year, how many times have you attempted to quit smoking? 12% have said, yes, I've tried to quit at least once in the last year. So 17% have ever tried to quit. There's a group trying to quit repeatedly each year. And amongst those who are trying to quit, how many have sought support from either a quit line, a, a, a community-based cessation support, or a healthcare professional? 1% the minority, when you think of three and a, a half million smokers with 1% accessing uh, uh, evidence-based cessation services. So the real issue here in Greece is that uh, we're smoking at very high rates, but there is not enough uh, of an incentive and not enough tension uh, for people to make quit attempts. 44%, 12%, at this rate, it will take a very long time to see cessation uh, at a population level. When we look at what people are using as far as uh, quitting smoking, amongst the highest uh, reported uh, product or method of quitting is electronic cigarettes. Closely around the same rate is uh, medications, so the NRTs and the pill-based medications for smoking cessation are around the same use. Now this isn't data on ever trying to use a cigarette or currently using an e-cigarette. This would be data on I'm making a quit attempt and I've chosen to use which method to assist me in that quit attempt. So you can see the popularity of e-cigarettes not only as a, a dual-use issue, but as a cessation method. It's not far behind though that we're seeing some of the other therapies, uh, and certainly counseling-based uh, programs are being used at a much lower rate, somewhere in the range of 5% overall. And usually we recommend those to be hand-in-glove, right? Uh, that you seek both counseling and, and, and the use of an aid. I want to show you again from Greece some data that's been collected by the University of Crete that goes one level deeper to talk about smokers here in Greece. And here we're looking at how many cigarettes per day, and you can see here these are very heavy smokers. Uh, we've got most smoking more than 16, uh, close to 70% per day, and some up above uh, 25, above the pack per day. Time to first cigarette in the morning, a proxy for a level of nicotine addiction. 70% are reporting to us within first 30 minutes of waking, highly addicted individuals. Uh, as far as the environment, people are living, working, playing in environments where they are exposed to secondhand smoke. Uh, there's a risk of that, as we all know, in and itself, but when you're trying to quit smoking or when you're thinking about making a quit attempt, one of the biggest barriers is to not feel you've got the environmental support. And uh, if you spent time uh, here in Greece or if you're living here, we, we know very well that uh, uh, there are big issues and barriers to overcome there. Another uh, important issue is, is what Professor Leonis uh, opened with, is rates of anxiety and depression. These are not surprising data because we see this internationally. We've got around 31% of our smokers reporting clinical depression uh, using screening tools uh, on this particular survey and around 11% anxiety. And that's not to mention uh, other forms of, of uh, mental health illness. Good news, bad news. Uh, when we asked about your feelings about quitting smoking uh, in the next 30 days, it's not the majority, it's 25% uh, or so are saying, yes, I, I'm thinking about it and I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to make a quit attempt. There is a big middle though, around 40% who want to quit smoking, they're not planning to do so immediately, it's something they're working in their head. Uh, they may never do so, uh, but it's certainly on their mind and something they're, they're contemplating. 
Uh, and then there's a group that's not ready. Again, a big majority. 36% uh, of this particular survey, which are uh, smokers from uh, the region of Crete, and we've repeated this now in Greece, uh, nationally that is, uh, around 36% uh, reporting that they're not ready, they're not even thinking about it. And here's a little data on number of quit attempts. We've got uh, a very small group making repeated quit attempts in, the, in a given year. Uh, in this particular survey, se almost 70% have never tried to make a quit attempt. Earlier we heard a different number. This is a much higher number, and, and depending on where you survey, you may get a, a different uh, approach. We asked about on a 1 to 10 scale, how, is, how important is it for you to quit smoking? The average response was 7.6. You can see the standard deviation there. That's high, but that's pretty good. That's very important for me to quit smoking. Even if I'm not ready, even if I'm not planning to, it is important to quit smoking. Uh, I do acknowledge that. Self-efficacy, again, on a 1 to 10 scale. This is really important. This is extremely low. One to 10, the average response is 3.7. I do not feel, and what is self-efficacy? It's how confident I feel that I, if I make the decision to do so, that I will be successful with quitting, that I can do it. 3.7, and of course they don't. They're suffering from mental health illness, heavy smokers, highly addicted, in environments where they are exposed to smoke and in, in the temptation to smoke on a daily basis. It makes perfect sense that this would be the big barrier. And that is why we're not seeing repeated quit attempts, uh, et cetera. So a very unique situation here in Greece that you do see in other countries and certainly within countries in particular populations. So the big challenge is to uh, help as many people as we can make more quit attempts because we don't expect everyone to be successful on the first quit attempt, and so the quit attempt himself is something that we value, um, and as much as possible using the evidence-based treatments that are available. And uh, evidence changes, so very important for all of us to keep on top of what's, what works and what doesn't work. The quitting process. You smoke, you make a quit attempt, you hope to be absent, but the truth is uh, lots of things get in the way of that. And there are personal environmental factors, genetics plays a role in how easy it is to quit. We talked about social factors, et cetera. Tobacco control policies play a role. And of course, even individuals who quit smoking relapse back to that usually within an early period, and here's a relapse curve uh, for those who do not quit, and usually it's 95% at the end of 12 months if you're not using a, a form of evidence-based support will relapse. Uh, but certainly those after a year who remain quit have a 35% rate of relapse even years out. So relapse is a big issue as well. Good news is evidence-based uh, treatments are available. Um, in 2017, this is in Greek on this slide, but these are English European guidelines. They were released in the month of May of last year. They are coming out in, I believe, 17 uh, European languages uh, in the next month, available online in print. Uh, I had the pleasure of being involved in this guideline group. Uh, a very practical guide that's uh, targeted to healthcare professionals in uh, how we treat, in 2017, uh, smoking cessation. The guideline also includes subchapters on high-risk populations, pregnancy, cardiovascular diseases, diabetics, COPD, um, and adolescents. So some, some uh, more information on these very important populations where treatment techniques are different. The guidelines give 80 recommendations in total. It's not a, a small number of uh, what evidence says as far as what we can do to, uh, to support cessation across population and ranks them. And I just wanted to quickly review what the guideline says in, in, in very key message type uh, process. Combining counseling with pharmacotherapies that are evidence-based is what the guideline said is, is the number one uh, tried and true method of quitting smoking. But the counseling techniques need to be specific and they describe what those are, and the medications need to be used in an advanced way in, in order for us to achieve effectiveness. And when we do, we can get a six-fold increase in rates of cessation. And what six-fold increase means at best is around 40% of people who try to quit smoking will be successful. The other 60% will relapse, and that's the best number. You can get a little higher in specialized programs, a little bit above 50%, but on average, that's what it says. Pharmacotherapy has moved in a big direction, and the guidelines talk a lot about combined use, prolonged use, individualized therapy. We're getting really uh, specific on when we have heavy smokers that can't quit, we can't sort of say just a little bit for a short period of time. We need to open our minds to uh, what the evidence says, and it does say that these are all in very important approaches, and for many smokers, they will need both prolonged, combined, multiple uh, medications, and adjustment of dosages, depending on how they respond uh, during their quit attempt. 
Uh, motivational interviewing is a technique being endorsed by the guidelines. It's something that we know works very well when people are not ready to quit smoking or when they find a particular barrier like they can't get past the last five cigarettes to explore that further. The guidelines speak about that. And on to harm reduction. Smoking reduction being an area that in the last five or six years has been given a lot of attention and there's a good evidence base now on what works. Um, it's not specific to e-cigarettes in this case. There is a, a statement in the guideline on that. But it talks a little bit about the importance of offering reduced to quit approaches, reducing the number of cigarettes. Uh, until recently, we were not recommending that to people, that you either decide to be ready or not ready. The in-between was not good enough. For those who are not ready, there is good evidence. It's not as good as being ready that if you reduce to quit will get you closer to quitting in a, a more rapid time period than if you were not to try it all or wait for motivation to, to be developed. And when we do so, we recommend the use of pharmacotherapy as a reduce to quit approach. That there is, is good evidence that, that the use of NRT and emerging evidence that the use of other pharmacotherapies can assist with that. And what does the guideline say on e-cigarettes? Um, first of all, this evidence will be up until very late in uh, 2016, probably the first month of 2017. I think it covered until the end of January. So there's been research in, in, uh, since that time. But the statement is not surprising to you. It's the same that you find in other guidelines that there's insufficient evidence to recommend the use of e-cigarettes e uh, at this, the present time. You can see here that the statement that there is no uh, evidence at the moment of severe adverse effects. We're starting to see literature now of acute respiratory effects. You've already spoken about that today and you will uh, further to now. Uh, in the in absence of studies that health professional, professionals should not be recommending the use of e-cigarettes. But there is a statement here around patients making a personal choice of whether they use e-cigarettes or not, provided they're aware of the risk benefit of doing so. So that's a, a very progressive statement for any of you who have read other guidelines, uh, that in the absence of information, we provide what we know. We're very clear to patients on, on what, what is not available and what is available, and that we're waiting for more information, but we support them in, in their uh, uh, and the decision to do so. I can let you know in the many trainings that we've done in Canada, but in Greece, uh, if we don't say that we're going to be talking about e-cigarettes during our training, it comes up as one of the first questions uh, that will you be speaking to us about the new devices, can we get the latest information. Everyone is very keen to be able to inform their patients appropriately on whether or not they should be using them. Um, and, and so the physicians certainly don't want to leave a training session if that topic is not covered. So very briefly, let me talk to you about clinical leadership. This is my area of, of expertise, is uh, introducing to clinicians the topic of smoking cessation and a little bit about what we've been doing. And here's a diagram I showed you earlier. Physicians and other clinicians, whether you're in specialty or primary care, have two very important roles to play. One, to promote a quit attempt. That we see patients who smoke, it's an, an important opportunity to both screen, discuss, and create some tension around the issue of, of uh, uh, tobacco use. And hopefully that involves promoting a quit attempt. And when someone is ready to ensure that they're informed and using the latest evidence-based treatment. So there's a dual role here. We don't just wait for someone to be ready. We want to uh, push them towards uh, wanting to make a quit attempt. And here are the various roles for, for healthcare professionals. The five A's model, which I just skipped past, is here. It's known to many people. Ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange follow-up. It's what we know in the clinical setting to be best practice. It means that you don't just advise and say, you really should quit smoking. Go off on your own and do so. It's that you really should quit smoking. I'm here to help you. We'll either find a program for you or I'll help you myself. And we're going to arrange a few appointments to make sure that you're able to do so uh, using the best practices and with support from a professional. This is the best practice model. And the challenge is that we do an OK job, not a great job, with the ask advice in the, the uh, healthcare community, but not a great job with the other two, which is to provide assistance with quitting. Here are some numbers from Greece. In uh, blue, you see today's visit. This is from survey data here in Greece. And in red, you see the last 12 months. And you can see just what I've said is we do an OK job with Ask Advise and almost nothing happening thereafter. Uh, the numbers are a little lower here in Greece than what I've seen in Canada and internationally, but the trend is pretty much the same. You'll just sort of see a boost there. Uh, and around 20% will receive assistance in, in other countries. Barriers are big. Barriers are big for clinicians as to why I can't uh, deliver treatment. And one of the big barriers is that I have not received the education, the training to be able to effectively, in my mind, intervene. I lack the confidence of what works, what doesn't work, and, and even question my role in, in, in being involved in cessation. We've done uh, a Cochrane review a, uh, and other systematic reviews that we've published. 
to find out how we can help clinicians help their patients quit smoking. And training is a necessary component, and we've put a lot of efforts into designing what we hope are great training programs for clinicians, but it's not the only thing that works, and they need to be combined with other forms of support, in particular, um, things like checklists, reminders. Clinicians are human beings, and they forget sometimes to ask at all times or to book the next appointment. So having the skills is not enough. And having also a team, so nurses or community programs that can support cessation when clinician schedules get too busy or they just don't have the time or the uh, incentive to do so, and then more advanced things. And we know that as many as you can combined, so multi-component interventions that take more than one activity, training plus incentives or training plus nursing support as an adjunct counseling form, work better than, than other forms of therapy. So a little bit about our work in Canada. It's called the Auto Model for Smoking Cessation. It's an international best practice program. We've published highly on it. I'm very proud of this program. I've worked for about 15 years uh, before arriving in Greece on it. It uh, began in one hospital and in Canada has gone across the country to involve clinicians in making this a standard of care. So that every time a patient enters hospital, they're spoken about uh, smoking, they receive support before they leave, and in general practice, whereas, whereas, where we rolled it out secondly, that every patient again has cessation addressed as a priority. Uh, that we don't let patients pass through our hands without addressing this very important issue. What we learned in this process is for a clinician to engage, they need to be motivated. They need to have the skills and they need to have opportunity. Uh, to, to, uh, to put them forward. Opportunity really means the environment needs to say, yeah, you should do it. We want you to do it. We may even pay you to do it in some cases. There is support. Things are easy to do. Abilities means that you need to have received training on, on how to do it and really good training in the latest guidelines. And motivation, I think, is the most important part. You've got to care enough to want to intervene with patients who smoke because it's not easy. So I'm going to close with a couple of key messages that we share with clinicians that wake them up right away. Uh, when we do a training session uh, anywhere, we've done them in Europe, but we've done them in particular here in Crete, uh, people may come in thinking it's going to be boring. And I'll show you a couple of the slides that we show them, and you see right away how enthusiastic they are about the opportunity to address cessation with their patients. First, that it's a clinical priority. Single most important intervention, whether you're a hospitalist or in particular in primary care that you can deliver. Your patients trust your advice more than anyone else. Healthcare professionals are among the most influential people to a smoker, more so than taxation, oh, that's a very important strategy, more so than media, again, an important strategy at a population level, but at an individual level, more so than family, is the role of a healthcare professional in influencing smoking. That you can't just advise, that you must offer support. We know very well that we can double success with quitting just by saying, and I can help you quit smoking. That this is an addiction, that it's been frustrating until now that your patients haven't been able to quit smoking despite your advice, but it's not that easy. This is a pathophysiological issue that needs to be addressed in the same way, in the same rigor we would any other clinical risk factor, which is my next slide. But the overwhelming majority are suffering from nicotine addiction. And that we treat this with the same rigor we do anything else that comes in. We spend lots of time measuring blood pressure and we forget about smoking. It doesn't make sense to do so. Smoking is the most important risk factor. And here for a clinician are the many things that they do. It's difficult to get someone to quit smoking, but when you do, these are number needed to treat. You need to treat a certain number of people to save one life. For a lot of things that we do, it's in the hundreds. For smoking, you treat nine people, you save one life. And these are some of the the things that uh, we have found are the most motivating for clinicians to say, you're right, it hasn't been easy. I'm not sure my patients will listen to me, but it's worth uh, making sure I put the right energy into it. And here's our Titan Creek project, funded by Global Bridges, an international organization. Uh, we developed a training program that's a day long with two booster sessions. We uh, tested it on the island of Crete, which is a beautiful place to visit if anyone hasn't already been there. Uh, we put in place some tools and supports both for patients and clinicians that uh, uh, were tailored to the primary care setting in Greece where this was tested. Uh, we've published on this. We saw great results uh, in, in our pilot testing, and here they are before you ask, advise, assist. In gray is the baseline, in red is the uh, post-assessment, and in uh, the lighter red color is the change. We saw almost a 50% increase in the rates of uh, offering assistance following a one-day and two hours afterwards booster session. That's a low cost uh, intervention. We sort of, uh, if you will, engage the medical community in the challenge of taking this on and uh, you can see here they took it up. 
This program is now rolling out nationally in both uh, Greece and Cyprus. We're very proud for that as part of a, a second project. Uh, we're working with universities, which are uh, uh, on screen here, and over the last five months or so, we've been able to train 300 uh, primary care providers uh, in evidence-based cessation. Uh, we hear every day that more people are interested in, in being trained, and we're continuing to do our work. And you can see in different parts of Greece and uh, Athens, Crete, uh, up in northern Greece, these are some of our training sessions. And it's been a great response. So uh, that's all I had to say in this topic as far as uh, what I was asked to cover. Thanks to uh, these folks here, both in Canada and uh, here in Greece, uh, for collaborating.